yes 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 good afternoon everyone welcome to the last session of our weekly webinar series on instrumental techniques in chemistry organized by department of chemistry nss college manjeri i am smitha assistant professor of chemistry nss college manjeri today our resource person is mr arvind k who is working as assistant professor of chemistry sp college chengnasheri and will deliver the topic how molecules behave in uv visible fluorescence and flash photolysis i am very happy to introduce arvind k in front of you and he took his msc degree in sacred heart college tevara and doing his phd on photoresponsive and theoretical studies on drug delivery systems in mg university he has 3 years of research experience in dye sensitized solar cell at photo science and photonics lab nist and he was a summer research fellow at <coughs> iic bangalore and jawaharlal nehru center for advanced scientific research institute bangalore and he has five international publications and two book chapters above all he is a public speaker on science on behalf of department of chemistry nss college manjeri i heartily welcome mr arvind k for our weekly webinar series and invite him to deliver the topic thank you mr arvind yeah thank you ms for your a uh, kind words of introduction and uh, i'm happy to have been invited by the department of chemistry in ss college manjeri for delivering a talk um so talking about the importance of chemistry so uh, i have been asked to take uh, the instrumental aspects of uh, the various uh, techniques that is uv fluorescence so i'll be talking on the point of view of a student the sense for students especially i have been told to do so so we'll go through some of the basics we'll go through the instrumentation we'll go through the applications thank you thank you ma'am and it's actually when you go through the applications or the kind of study which you do with all these instruments you'll be able to understand how these instruments are really useful so uh, my talk is oriented in that particular direction so talking about the importance of chemistry uh, you should be knowing the first thing which we do in the morning uh, when we wake up is brushing our teeth right so when you brush your teeth you are actually dealing with polymer chemistry because you are uh, toothbrushes basically made of polymer there is something which i say everywhere then you use uh, the paste which is nothing but gel which is basically known as gel chemistry it's kind of a gel which also comes under chemistry you use water h2 that is inorganic chemistry to wash off all what you have used all what you have used for brushing your teeth then the next thing you do is you take a bath by taking a bath you use a soap this is nothing but sodium salt of long chain fatty acid again organic chemistry and you, you wash off all these froths and micelles and soap froths using water h2o again in organic chemistry then you use a textile which is nothing but a polymer material which is known as uh, a cloth for uh, you know taking away all these water and then for a refreshment effect what you do is you apply titanium dioxide nano structure titanium dioxide which is known as powder okay Uh, on your face so that you will be really refreshed that is again a nanotechnology or in organic chemistry then you have your food that is food chemistry it goes into your body it is biochemistry and from there you go into your college i work in sb college changnashiri but i uh, stay in ernakulam which is my hometown so i travel every day so while traveling of course i uh, use a bus or a train the metal the body of which is basically made of metal again in organic chemistry okay physics people say it is physics which is making all these run but basically the petrol or the diesel which you pour into it that is basically organic chemistry so basically chemistry is the thing which is uh, making it move then once you reach the college what you do is you use a chalk or a board which is basically a, a calcium carbonate thing again in organic chemistry and nowadays we use plastic boards and uh, pen the content the ink of which is organic chemistry and the whole material is basically plastic which is again polymer chemistry so starting from uh, waking up in the morning that is brushing your teeth to uh, night just before you sleep you know you drink a, a glass of water just to prevent heart attack you know just to dilute your blood or stuff like that you are actually dealing with chemistry so i'm very happy to be a part of uh, the chemistry family by completely understanding its importance so 
with this brief introduction, we'll directly go on to a topic that is how molecules behave. UV visible fluorescence and flash photosynthesis. The reason which I um, opted for this topic is one is my experience in this. And the second thing is the fundamental thing which you do after taking your IR, whether your molecule is uh, the intended molecule or not, by just identifying the pencil group. The next thing what you do is you take a UV visible absorption. This is a common technique which is used by even in colleges, you know, for a degree projects and PG projects. So this is actually a common technique which is used by everyone and it is that much important. So why not, I thought, why not talk about UV visible spectra and then connected to that, why not talk about fluorescence? And from there, the flash photolysis which I used to do while I was working with solar cells. So the topic is actually entitled as how molecules behave. So the reason why I entitled this topic as how molecules behave is uh, actually molecule has a tendency to behave depending upon the kind of radiation it is interacting. So molecule doesn't have any intrinsic property of thinking or something like that, but it has a property of responding to whatever comes in its way. And the major response of this molecule which we use for studying their properties is by its interaction with electromagnetic radiation. So as you may know, the electromagnetic radiation, it has a high energy gamma rays at one end and the low energy or the highest wavelength radio waves at another end. It is actually bifurcated into so many sections. The gamma rays it has its own utility, X-rays has its own utility, UV visible and UV as well as visible region has its own utility, which actually comes under the electronic transition, which we are going to deal uh, today. And the near IR region, mid IR region, and the fire IR region, or in general, the IR region has its own utility of dealing with the vibrational spectroscopy or IR spectra. Probably such a class would have been taken already. Then we have the microwave region where you deal with the rotational spectra. And ultimately, it goes on to the radio wave region where you utilize all these molecules for uh, communication. So, coming on to how this ultraviolet or visible region interacts with the molecule, the answer is very simple. When you sign a molecule with UV light or visible light, the electrons present in the HOMO, that is highest occupied molecular orbital, it gets excited to the LUMO, that is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. This excited electron has some properties in the excited state and the de-excitation of which results in so many of the properties, the de-excitation of which can result in so many processes and all these processes are actually uh, we are actually capable of studying all these processes using various techniques so we will be highlighting all those techniques which we will which we will be using for studying the de-excitation process which is taking place in the molecule so when you are dealing with the uv visible or fluorescence or uh, laser flash photolysis all the fundamentals of this falls under the category of jablonski diagram so you probably may be knowing what a Jablonski diagram is. Jablonski diagram actually tells you the various electronic states of a molecule. But when, you know, when a molecule is said to absorb a UV light or a visible light, it's not actually the electron alone which is being, uh, which is absorbing the radiation. You know? Along with the electron, the molecule as a whole is excited. That's why you name the molecule instead of naming the electron. You name the molecule to be in a singlet state, you say the molecule to be in the triplet state, so you say the molecule to be in the quartet state or some other state, and all these naming is given for a molecule. So an excitation for the molecule in the presence of UV region or the in the uh, uh, presence of UV or visible light is not only taking place in an electron, but the entire excitation is taking place in the molecule as a whole. That is something which we have to understand. So for the benefit of the students, you know, how the singlet triplet name came, that has to be also told along with this talk. So the name singlet and triplet state actually comes from the total spin multiplicity of the system. In this diagram, uh, in this uh, slide, what you can see is you can see an alphabet S. This alphabet actually tells you the total spin present in a system. The total spin present in the system means if you have a system consisting of 10 electrons, you take the spin of each electron, add it completely. First electron, it should be having plus half spin. Then the second electron is minus half. Third electron is plus half. Fourth electron is minus half. So you take the overall spin, the total spin, by adding the individual spins of all these electrons. You add it, and ultimately the answer will be uh, the total value of S. 
for a system having s elect uh, 10 electrons the total number of uh, uh, electrons is 10 so the total value of s will be zero because plus half minus half plus half minus half the even number of electrons results in the total spin of zero as a result of which the spin multiplicity which is nothing but 2s plus 1 gives a value of 1 since the spin multiplicity or spin multiplicity which is defined by the equation 2s plus 1 is giving a value of 1 that particular state is known as single state so if a molecule is actually designated as a single state then you should understand that the molecule is actually completely paired the electrons present in the molecule are completely paired there are no free electrons then you should understand that the plus half or minus spin okay as i told you s is the total spin of the system and if you consider if you consider any molecule which is normally in the ground state almost 99% of the molecules in the ground state are singlet in state if they are not charged of course of course we are not talking about charged molecule we are talking about neutral molecules all these are present in the singlet state because all these molecules are having paired electrons and they do not react so are there any exceptions maybe probably the students can think are there any exceptions what what i said right now that 99% of the molecules or almost 100% of the molecules are uh, singlet in the ground state because if you have thought right of course the example is oxygen oxygen is one particular molecule whose uh, spin multiplicity is triplet in the ground state rather than singlet when all the other molecules in the ground state remains as singlet you know oxygen is the only molecule which remains as a triplet in the ground state which is actually proved by molecular orbital theory the main advantage of molecular orbital theory when you deal with the uh, spectroscopy is that it is capable of predicting the triplet behavior of oxygen in the ground state okay so uh, i hope you understood the, the importance of singlet and triplet state now we will go through the various possible uh, processes which a molecule will undergo when it gets excited a molecule always uh, stays in the singlet ground state all the singlet states are designated as s and all the triplet states are designated as t so triplet state is a state in which the total spin of the system total spin multiplicity of the system will be 3 that is 2s plus 1 will be 3 okay and the value of s will be 1 so if the value of s should be 1 then the electronic arrangement in the molecule should be as which is shown in this diagram the electronic arrangement of the molecule should be such that there should be two electrons which are uh, spinning in the same direction. So plus half and plus half of these two gives a value of 1 to s. So s will be equal to plus half plus half that gives a value of 1 and 2s plus 1 which is nothing but spin multiplicity gives a value of 3 and that gives the name triplet for these states. As I told you before any of the neutral molecule the ground state should be uh, will be rather uh, singlet in the ground state and ground state is usually designated as zero with the suffix so s0 actually represents the ground state of any molecule s1 represents the first excited singlet state of the molecule s2 represents the first excited triplet uh, second excited singlet state of the molecule and t1 represents the first excited triplet state of the molecule as you may know the electronic transitions takes place so fast okay that there will be a vertical transition of all these molecules so in this diagram each and every electronic state the s0 the entire thing in the s0 is known as a one uh, the singlet electronic state of the ground state this is singlet electronic state of the first excited state second excited state and so on so all these electronic excited states are subdivided into so many categories 0 1 2 3 4 and 5 Except all these are actually vibrational states which are present in the electronic state okay the purest form of spectrum which you can always obtain is rotational spectrum because it is not intervened by anything if you are taking vibrational spectra if you are taking ir spectra that vibrational spectra definitely will be having lines corresponding to rotational spectrum and when you come to uv or visible region which is uh, a bit having a bit higher energy compared to ir as well as microwave what happens is all the spectra associated with uv definitely will be associated with vibrational transitions as well as rotational transitions so each vibrational line over here is further split into rotational lines but in the Blanc diagram we do not highlight that because it is the vibrational lines which uh, gives some important properties over here so all these electronic states are split up into various vibrational lines and since the electronic excitations are so fast so fast in the sense in uh, femtosecond range that is 10 raised to minus 15 range 
the electronic excitation takes place in a straight manner and whenever a molecule which is present at the ground state you always expect the molecule if it is in the most stable state if you are not giving any temperature it is remaining in the room temperature not under the influence of any other factors such as pressure temperature as i already told you etc probably you expect the molecule to be present in the lowest vibrational state that is zero state of the s0 electronic state so when such a molecule is irradiated with uv light or visible light there a vertical excitation of all these molecules occurs and from here our spectroscopy begins so when this vertical excitation occurs what happens is there are so many phases of this molecule one phase is the molecule can go up it can directly come down by de excitation another phase is by the, the process by which it can come down can be simple vibration that is one possibility the molecule can vibrate and along with the vibration the molecule can dissipate this energy another possibility is the molecule can transfer its energy to some other molecule which is basically known as quenching that that some other molecule is taking energy from this excited molecule and the excited molecule becomes de excited that is what you use in solar cells you excite a, a ruthenium complex which was my uh, research uh, when i uh, started off in nist uh, which i later on dropped because of personal reasons anyway you excite this molecule and that is actually quenched by tio2 and the molecule is actually de excited you know so that uh, uh, what do you say quenching is another possible pathway another possible pathway is the molecule can give the energy as it is in the form of light uh, which is known as fluorescence and phosphorescence uh, which will we will deal with uh, which we will talk we will be talking when we deal with the fluorescence spectroscopy so when this molecule is excited the first thing which you have to understand is no molecule will remain in an excited state which is greater than s1 for a very long time maybe even a time which is lesser than femtosecond you know the molecule for a fraction of a second fraction of a second in the sense given time lesser than femtosecond it goes on to the excited state once it reaches the excited state any other excited state other than s1 that is s2 or s3 or s4 immediately the molecule undergoes an internal conversion and it reaches the s1 state that is the first thing the molecule does a molecule never undergoes a, a sideways transition so there is no possibility for a molecule to go to a triplet state directly but always there is a vertical transition and the molecule gets excited to the highest excited state depending upon the energy which is given it it necessarily doesn't always remain s1 but if it goes to any other excited state other than s1 to s2 or s3 definitely the molecule will come down to s1 singlet excited state and from there the mol the fate of the molecule is determined so when a molecule gets transferred from a singlet to a singlet state the process is known as internal conversion so by the process of internal conversion the molecule comes to s1 state and the problem is the molecule can reach any of the vibrational states of the s1 state so from starting from s1 s2 just imagine the molecule has reached uh, the third vibrational level when it gets de excited uh, it can directly come to s1 level through internal conversion it might reach five, fifth level or fourth level or third level even just imagine it has reached the fourth level as shown in this diagram even if it reaches the fourth level according to kasha's rule maybe you can note it down according to kasha's rule once the molecule undergoes internal conversion and reaches the s1 level definitely the molecule will undergo a vibrational relaxation and reach the lowest possible vibrational level of the singlet state so the one thing which you have to understood which you really uh, don't uh, uh, go deep in your uh, uh, academics is that kasha's rule whichever state the molecule reaches you know maybe it's s1 maybe it's t1 the molecule always undergoes a vibration cascading a vibrational relaxation making the molecule reach the lowest vibrational level of that particular level that particular electronic state the lowest vibrational level reaching actually results in a decrease in energy of this molecule so if you give 10 kilojoules of energy to the molecule definitely there will be a small amount of decrease in 10 kilojoules from 10 kilojoules it might be 9.5 or 9.3 just because of the vibrational relaxation even though the molecule is excited that vibrational relaxation actually results in a, a redshift of emission spectrum which we will be talking about once it reaches the lowest possible vibration energy level of the s1 state the next state of the molecule is as i told you either it can undergo again an internal conversion that is it reach back, reaches back as zero state by simple vibration which is basically known as vibrational relaxation that is one possibility 
another possibility is for this molecule to radiate this energy in the form of light in the form of electromagnetic radiation and reach the ground state which is also internal conversion because it is a transition between s and s s1 and s0 and the uh, radiation the de-excitation of molecule by radiating energy is basically known as fluorescence which approximately takes place in between nanosecond and uh, microsecond most probably in the nanosecond uh, the uh, main uh, uh, proof that it is taking place in the nanosecond is let's imagine you have given light to a uh, molecule which is fluorescent the fluorescence stops immediately when you cut off the light the same doesn't hold for phosphorescence phosphorescence is another process in which again the molecule gives uh, gets de-excited by giving light but that de-excitation is actually taking place from triplet state into a single state so the process is like this once the molecule reaches the s1 state or v0 state if there are energy levels which can which are having equal energy something like uh, an equal potential surface which is having equal energy corresponding to v0 and a higher excited state energy is corresponding to t1 that is if the higher vibration energy levels of a triplet state and the lower vibration energy levels of a singlet state coincide with same energy there is always a, if the energies are degenerate that is accurate to us there is always a possibility for this molecule to go and transfer to the triplet state because they are having similar energy when the similar energy is resulted what happens is there is always a possibility for this molecule to go from the singlet state to the triplet state once it reaches the triplet state what happens is again a vibrational cascading is resulted it reaches the lowest possible vibration level of the triplet state which is again kasha's rule and from there it can emit radiation and if it emits radiations it is basically known as fluorescence a phosphorescence which actually takes place in millisecond region millisecond to microsecond region and this phosphorescence uh, always uh, you know exists even after the incoming light is cut off it actually exists for a longer time compared to fluorescence because fluorescence takes place in nanosecond and phosphorescence takes place in micro to millisecond so this is basically the fate of all these molecules so if you have to learn the fate of molecules in the excited state how the molecule goes to the excited state basically that is uh, dealt with uh, uv visible spectra and if you are uh, trying to learn how the molecule emits light if the molecule has a property of emitting light how the molecule uh, emits light is actually dealt with fluorescence uh, spectroscopy uh, using fluorinator and if you are so much keen in understanding how the molecule behaves in the excited state by keeping it in the excited state you use laser flash photolysis laser flash photolysis is seldom used compared to uv visible as well as fluorimeter technique you know what is an electronic absorption we'll just uh, brush up through all these electronic absorption is uh, nothing but uh, the total energy of the molecule according to bone m1 per approximation is uh divided among e electronic e vibration e rotational is something which is known to you and when the molecule is actually excited what happens is the all these electronic states are excited and the frequency corresponding to excitation the wave number corresponding to excitation is given by this formula there is something which you study in your bsc as well as nsc level and from there you go on to frank condon principle you know what a frank condon principle is when you analyze all these uh, uh, absorption spectra what you can always see is uh certain vibrational levels are having a higher intensity compared to the expected vibrational energy level this is the uh, morse potential diagram morse curve diagram for the ground state as well as excited state you normally expect the molecule to be excited from uh, the lowest possible state of s0 state to the lowest possible state of the first excited state so normally what we expect is the zero to zero transition should be having a higher energy or a higher intensity and not higher energy i'm sorry higher intensity so that transition should always be having a higher intensity is our expectation but our expectation is totally different from what what uh, science teaches us hence we deal with frank condon principle so frank condon principle so frank condon principle is another reason why a molecule doesn't go to triplet state directly which we will be dealing in uh, uh, laser flash photolysis so triplet state directly always a singlet vertical excitation takes place because according to frank condon principle a molecule undergoes uv visible absorption so fast that there will be a uh, uh, very less time for the nuclei to move that means the bond distance doesn't change while, during an electronic absorption so in the ground state if you go on with the quantum mechanical calculation the probability of the molecule is to stay at the middle at the center where there is maximum probability according to side squared 
in the V0 state. So when the molecule is excited, the molecule will be reaching that vibrational state where it can directly go vertically. Four possible possibilities for Planck-Condon principle is this, in which the internuclear distance in the excited state is same that of the internuclear distance in the ground state. Second diagram, internuclear distance in the excited state is lesser than the internuclear diagram in the ground state. And the third and fourth diagram, the internuclear distance in the excited state is higher. And in the fourth diagram, the fourth uh, picture, it is the highest. Okay. And out of these two possibilities, the second possibility is always uh, abandoned because uh, it is very hardly uh, rare. It is very, 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 very rare for a molecule to have an internuclear distance lesser than those in the ground state when it is excited, when it is having high energy. So this diagram is uh, not taken into consideration. This possibility is also uh, very rare because whenever you excite the molecule, of course, the internuclear distance definitely changes. It undergoes a faster vibration. So these two diagrams are equally valid and these two diagrams are equally valid for frank quantum principle. From there, you have something which is known as dissociation. If the excitation of all these molecules takes place to that vibration level, which correspond to the dissociation of the molecule, then you call it a dissociation level. And another concept which you deal with the frank quantum principle is the pre-dissociation. That is, you excite a molecule from the ground state, you go on to the first excited state, um, the first or the second, uh, just imagine you are going to the first excited state to a particular vibrational state. That particular vibrational state is stable in the first excited state, but just imagine you have another continuous state which coincides with the energy of the first that particular vibrational state where the molecule has come. Since this another excited state which is having a dissociation limit corresponding to the energy of the vibration where the molecule is sitting now, even though you don't intend the molecule to dissociate, the molecule, since it is a degenerate energy level, it transfers itself into the another unexpected energy level and it undergoes dissociation. And this con condition is basically known as pre-dissociation. Okay? And from there, we come on to the crux of uh, the uh, UV visible absorption spectra. Uh, the UV visible absorption spectra always uh, is based on beer lambert's law. And Beer Lambert's law is something which is known as I is equal to I0 into 10 raised to minus epsilon dc, where epsilon is the molar extinction coefficient, b is the thickness, that is the path length of by which the, uh, your light moves, and c is the concentration which you use in colorimetry also, right? The same principle holds for uh, the UV visible absorption spectrophotometer also. So whenever you have, you get a chance to go on to any of the labs, you know, it is always better to visit labs because uh, touching an instrument, experiencing it by seeing it is totally different from learning the theory of the instrumentation. So this is how a UV visible chamber looks like. If you have a UV visible spectra in your college, of course, uh, just go through it and in the presence of teacher, please do it. And here you can keep the samples. And this is the monitor where uh, you use, uh, uh, you, 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 uh, you take the UV visible absorption spectrum. As I told you, absorbance is measured according to epsilon CL, well C is the concentration, L is the path length. And epsilon is the molar absorption coefficient. Now coming on to the instrumentation of UV visible spectra. Basically, the various parts of UV visible spectra are highlighted over here. It actually has a radiation source. Okay. Now what you have to, what we have to see is the uh, what we actually want is we have to find out where the molecule absorbs. Why is that important? Various functional groups absorbs in various regions. Okay. So this can be used as a preliminary identification, not a confirmatory, though preliminary identification technique for identifying the functional group. That is one important thing. If you have any kinds of transition. Pi pi transition, N to sigma star transition, sigma to sigma star transition, MLCT transition, LMCT transition. If you want to know how a solvent changes the behavior of the molecule, how a solvent changes the excited state of a molecule, how the introduction of a functional group differences make a difference in the electronic spectra of the molecule if, if, by introducing an NH2 group, if you want to know, by introducing an NO2 group, if you actually want to know how or the uh, various excited state changes its energy level, you can use UV visible spectra. You can use the data which you obtain from UV visible spectra. We'll go to applications also. So the first thing is you have to supply energy to the molecule. Since it is utilizing UV as well as visible region, you have to take up lamps which is capable of supplying UV light as well as visible light. Deuterium lamp, hydrogen lamp, tungsten halogen lamp, xenon lamp, tungsten filament, and mercury vapor. All these are 
various lamps. It depends upon the company and the instrument which you use. All these varieties of lamps or a combination of these lamps are actually used for uh, producing UV as well as visible light in your system. And again, after the radiation source, you require something which is known as an optical system. The optical system definitely consists of a monochromator. It consists of a pluricromator. It consists of in, in, in inlet lens. It, uh, it consists of inlet slits, exit slits. You have collimated lens. You have uh, diffraction grating, etc., which we will be dealing when we uh, go on to the uh, direct um, go on to the diagram instrumentation diagram. Then you have the detector. Once the light which comes from the sample. It passes through the optical system. It then passes through the sample. And after the uh, uh, entire light passes through the sample, you know, the light which is coming out of the sample is actually being detected by the detector. And this detector is basically a photo multiplier tube or a photo diode or whatever it is, which again depends upon the instrument. So these are the various detectors which are used. And the most important detector is photo multiplier tube, which is used as a detector. And the method which you use for keeping a sample is uh, uh, a small cuvette. It is made up of cords or silica or glass or polythene or whatever it is. That or again depends upon the instrument which you are using. For a standard instrument, deuterium lamp is used basically for giving out UV light. Tungsten lamp is used for giving out uh, what do you say visible light. So the basic instrumental layout is like this. When you switch on the instrument, you have deuterium lamp as well as tungsten lamp activated. This deuterium lamp as well as tungsten lamp it gives light to the filter. This filter, what is does is the instrument is operated in such a way. Normally, a normal UV visible instrument is operated in such a way that one wavelength is led through the instrument for reaching the sample at one particular time. That is, if you start, if you the once you switch on the instrument, you go to the software which deals with the instrument, you give the range of wavelength. So when you keep the sample, you switch on the instrument, you switch on the process. What happens is if you have given the range of 300 to 600 nanometer, first 300 light is passed through this, then 301 nanometer light is passed, then 302, 303, 304. So in each step, you know, that particular wavelength of light is transferred. But the problem is the deuterium lamp and the tungsten lamp doesn't know which wavelength it is transferring because it is giving UV light completely. The tungsten lamp is giving UV light, the visible light completely. So it is the filter. The filter which actually filters the light which we actually require. But the filter is actually nothing but a WebGR. It actually is capable of filtering only in that particular region. So, so what the filter does is it filters the entire light which is coming from uh, the deuterium lamp or the tungsten lamp. And what happens is that particular range of wavelength is given onto the monochromator. So what the monochromator does is the monochromator from that particular range, which the filter has given, from that particular range, the monochromator cuts down all the wavelength and it passes only one particular wavelength, the desired wavelength, to pass through it. And once that desired wavelength, for example, 300 nanometer, so UV light is being produced, the filter cuts off all the other light, passes the uh, UV spectrum, and the monochromator passes that particular wavelength, probably 300 nanometer, to pass through the monochromator slit. So the 300 nanometer slowly moves on to the beam splitter. In the beam splitter, what is does is the entire light is split into two. That monochromated, collimated light is split into two. It actually, the splitter splits the light into two and one part of the light passes through the sample and another part of the light passes through the reference. Here, sample and reference becomes very important because, you know, when you are dealing with uh, uh, a UV visible spectra, solvent has a very important effect. So in whichever state you are taking, you know, the molecule, maybe it's a solid state, you can actually uh, take a, a, a reflection spectra. In the liquid state, the gaseous state, of course, you don't take, you know. So solid state and the liquid state, usually you will be using the UV spectra for the liquid state. So in the liquid state, when you are taking, you usually dissolve your molecule in a solvent. And the problem is the solvent also has a tendency to absorb in all these ranges, UV range. So what we have done is, we are always keep a reference of the same solvent which is used for the uh, same solvent which is used to prepare the sample. So the sample is dissolved in a solvent, that solvent is kept as a reference. So the incoming light which is split by the monochromator is actually passed through the reference as well as sample. And the light which is coming out of the reference as well as sample reaches the photodiode or the photomultiplier tube. And by analyzing these two lights, by taking the difference of these two transmitted light, you will be able to understand what light the sample has been absorbed.
So basically, the deuterium as well as the tungsten lamp, it gives UV as well as visible light. So this UV as well as visible light is actually initially filtered using a filter. And from that filter, the desired wavelength, that is the 300 nanometer or whatever wavelength which you require or the range of wavelength which is given, each wavelength is given to the beam splitter individually by using a monochromator or a diffraction, which we'll be looking it into. And from there, you have a beam splitter. This beam splitter splits the light into two. One passes through the reference, another passes through the sample. The reference is important because the solvent also produces an absorption. Our aim is to find out the absorption of our sample alone, our molecule alone. By taking the difference in the absorption, you will be getting the absorption spectra of the molecule. That, that sums up the instrumentation of uh, the UV visible spectra. Here, you use something which is known as monochromator. The monochromator you have, this is the basic structure of a monochromator. You have an entrance slit. The light which comes from the filter, it enters to through the monochromator. It passes through the diffraction grating, which is shown over here. And once the diffraction grating results in producing one particular light, it goes out through the exit slit. So this is the entire diagram of a monochromator, and this is the diffraction grating. Normally, diffraction, we always deal with diffraction. We take the example of a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, right? So uh, uh, the light from during a solar eclipse, the light from the sun, it gets diffracted, you know, it's from the moon, and that diffracted light will be reaching there. That is a normal example which we give. But there, the light is actually diffracted from the edges of the moon, okay? And it is reaching the Earth in a focusing fashion. But in normally in UV visible spectra, the diffraction is actually in a reflection form. And the reflection diffracting has uh, so many uh, uh, triangular shaped slabs, which is kept like this. So when you switch on the instrument, you know, what happens is the spacing between the triangular space slab, the spacing is actually being adjusted. And the difference in the spacing, which is D, it results in the various wavelengths. So the diffraction grating is uh, set into that particular instrument such that it is capable of producing the desired wavelength when the instrument reaches or uh, demands that particular wavelength. So the difference in the D actually results in the various wavelengths which is produced by the diffraction grating. By changing the value of D, what happens is the, uh, the uh, combination of the reflected wavelength is differentiated and one particular wavelength is actually produced using the diffraction grating. So the diffraction grating is actually the so-called marmum of the so-called uh, UV visible spectra because it actually gives you the desired that particular wavelength only. And once that diffraction grating by changing D, which is controlled by the instrument, that particular wavelength is observed, it uh, goes pass through the sample. And once it passes through the sample, the sample absorbs light and the transmitted light, which is different from that which is absorbed. The uh, transmitted light in the sense, the light which is not absorbed by the transmitter, it reaches the photodiode. Photodiode and photomultiplier tubes, they both are used as detectors. The photodiode, it produces one electron from one photon. But a photomultiplier tube, it multiplies the, uh, the electrons which the photon gives. Actually, photomultiplier tube is the most reliable detector which you use in UV visible as well as flat photolysis as well as chlorimeter. The most reliable in the sense, you know, the intensity of the light which is coming through uh, the sample and the intensity of the light which is coming to the reference will be very less. So since the intensity is very less, you know, for a plausible amount of detection, for a plausible amount of calibration and data retrieval, you have to uh, multiply, you have to, uh, what do you say, amplify the so-called uh, light. So the basic amplification is taking place in photomultiplier tube, which is absent in photodiode. Because photodiode, when one photon comes and falls, one electron is uh, generated. But in a photomultiplier tube, the working principle is different. When uh, an incoming photon comes and falls onto an electrode, which is basically kept, an electron is actually being generated. That electron hits onto a dynode, which generates more electron, which goes on hits onto another dynode. And you have a series of dynodes like this. And ultimately, when it reaches the anode, you know, you have a stream of electrons. And the energy or the intensity of the electron is directly correlated to that photon, which is falling. So the entire intensity of the electrons and its energies actually is actually related to the light, which is falling on onto this uh, photomultiplier tube, which is the detector. So by looking at the intensity of the electron and its energy, you have a direct correlation between the light which actually fell onto the detector. Since you have so many electrons, since you have an intensity being multiplied, what happens is the detection becomes very easy and the analysis of the result is very nice. So 
coming on to the application of UV visible spectroscopy, as I told you, if you have any impurities in your molecule, uh, one method is by using UV visible spectra. Uh, just imagine you have you go and purchase something which uh, from your market, you know, you are uh, uh, reluctant to use it because you think that you have some impurity. Okay, you take the pure sample, you take a UV spectra, you take the sample which you got from the market, you take the UV spectra, if there is some difference, definitely there is some impurity. So detection of impurity is one such application. Structural elucidation of organic compounds. Structural elucidation in the sense, it is not um, accurate as like uh, NMR or something like that. If you have any functional group, if you have a possibility of uh, 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 an MLCT or LLMCT transition, all such transitions can be uh, identified using UV visible spectra and quantitative determination of compounds. Quantitative determination of compounds means that is another application. It, uh, quantitative determination means something which you do in your uh, lab, you know. Calorimetry, uh, estimation of chromium, I suppose it is used. It is uh, uh, done by using calorimetry. That is uh, you, uh, you, uh, you, uh, uh, a nickel complex or something like that, you know. You uh, first prepare a graph of uh, known concentrations. You will be getting a straight line graph. And when your teacher or your examiner actually gives you an unknown concentration by extrapolating from the graph, you will be getting the unknown concentration which is given to you. So that uh, graph is actually plotted using a concentration as well as the absorbance which you obtain from your UV visible spectra. So the UV visible spectra, since it depends upon the absolute CL value, concentration value, this can directly be used for qualitative, quantitative determination of compounds as well. Another important aspect of UV visible spectra is the solvent effects can be easily be studied because many organic reactions are solvent sensitive okay we are actually dealing in a world with in which we always like to use water but water cannot be used always solvent sensitive reactions are there if you use the solvent if you change the solvent the yield is really matter so what happens to a molecules excited state homo lumo homo plus one lumo minus one i mean lumo plus one homo minus one excited state what happens to that all such factors can be dealt with uh, UV visible spectra because the absorption spectra of a molecule in water will not be same as the absorption spectra of the same molecule in ethanol because this ethanol has some kind of interactions with the, the HOMO as well as LUMO compared to that of water, the interactions will be different as a result of which the absorption spectra will be different, the absorption wavelength will be different. Okay, so such uh, things can be studied. So this is uh, an interesting uh, spectra which is from my published paper, which uh, long back, very long back from NIST, I'm a co-author of this paper. Let's imagine that we have plotted an absorption spectra of this molecule. This molecule is actually a peculiar, it has a bipyridine, it has a double bond over here, an olefinic bond, and it has an uh, NCS3 twice group. NCS3 twice group, the nitrogen atom, at, uh, it has a lone pair, it is actually a donor system, and this actually acts as an acceptor system. Since you have a donor acceptor system, there is always a possibility of a charge transfer transition which is taking place from this nitrogen to this nitrogen, right? So this actually, uh, uh, represents the UV visible spectra. UV visible spectra is always plotted by absorbance in the uh, uh, y-axis to wavelength in the x-axis. This actually explains the UV visible spectra of the molecule at various pH conditions. You can see that when the pH is very high, the peak at approximately 380 nanometer is very high, while the peak of the same uh, at 500 nanometers, approximately 490 nanometers low. But when you decrease the pH when you make the solution more acidic when it reaches 3.6 the peak value at 380 nanometer it goes drastically down and the peak at uh, uh, 480 nanometer goes drastically up hope you can find the difference and you have an isospecific point over here uh, you leave that you know uh, so by comparing these two peaks you can actually you are actually studying the pH dependent absorption pH dependent uh, behavior of all these molecules can you presume what has happened over here? Just think for a uh, maybe five to ten seconds. Okay. The answer is this: when S plus is given to the molecule, which is more basic? You know, are these two nitrogen more basic or this nitrogen more basic? The NS2, the primary amine, it has its lone pair which is circulated in the uh, what do you say your aromatic ring. Hence, these two nitrogens are actually highly basic. As a result of which the H plus goes and coordinates down to this molecule. Once this coordination happens, what happens is the electron density over here slowly starts shifting to the H plus over region because you have a positive region right here now. And there will be a very high charge transfer trans transition which is taking place from the 
amine, primary amine nitrogen to this region. That star stands for transition increases when you in decrease the pH. The solution is more acidic, the more positive charge is over here, more molecule will be uh, uh, in this particular fashion as a result of which a high intensity charge transfer transition can be expected. But when there is no charge transfer transition at all because of H plus, when there is minimum charge transfer transition, this will be the absorption of spectrum of the molecule. That is your absorption, which is due to the nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen. This particular group is being portrayed at 380 nanometer. So UV visible spectra can be used to study the pH dependent behavior, temperature dependent behavior. You know, so many kind of behavior can be studied. It all depends upon how you want to deal with the system. So we have a wide variety of application for UV visible spectra. Then you come on to fluorescent spectra. Fluorescent spectra usually deals with fluorescence, phosphorescence, bioluminescence, chemiluminescence, etc. Okay. So as I mentioned uh, earlier in your uh, uh, Jablonski diagram, the vibrational equilibrium before fluorescent results in some loss of excitation energy. As I told you, your molecule, if you can close your eyes and uh, think for a moment, uh, the molecule gets excited to the excited state to any S3, S2 or S3 excited state. It undergoes an intersystem closing. It comes to S1 excited state. Probably I'll go back to that particular side. S1 state. And once it reaches the S1 state, definitely it has to undergo a vibration transition. So the internal conversion itself results in loss of energy. And from there, there will be definitely another loss of energy due to the vibrational cascading before the molecule reaches, after the molecule reaches the V0 state of S1 state. As a result of which, the fluorescence or the emission spectra always results in a higher wavelength or a stoke shift is always expected for the emission spectra for the fluorescence. So emission spectra is nothing but it is similar to what you observe in the absorption spectra. The only difference in the emission spectra and the absorption spectra is the absorbance is uh, uh, is changed by emission. So here you are seeing what the molecule absorbs and in emission spectra you see what the molecule emits. That is the only difference between uh, uh, UV spectra and the emission spectra and there is always a stoke shift because some amount of energy is naturally lost and the emission uh, normally what we expect is if you give a molecule 10 kilojoules of energy then the molecule comes down it should be giving us back that the same very same 10 kilojoules of energy which is not being expected in uh, fluorescent spectra because of the so-called reasons and always a stoke shift is actually expected and uh, this is the fluorescence uh, uh, time dependent delay of fluorescent spectra and uh, the fluorescence decay time we are running short of time i know so i am skipping off all these topic and the fluorescence intensity is given by a formula which is similar to that of uh, your uh, what do you say beer lambert's law which is given by uh, phi into I0 into ABC, where ABC are molar extinction coefficient, the volume as well as the concentration, and uh, you have the formula directly. We directly go on to the instrumentation of fluorescent spectra. Here, the instrumentation of fluorescent spectra is uh, thought provoking because the instrumentation over here is very similar to that of absorption spectra. Okay. An addition to an absorption, UV visible absorption spectrophotometer in fluorescent spectra is you additionally have a monochromator after the sample emits. In the absorption spectra, you have a light source, tungsten uh, light source or uh, deuterium light source or whatever it is, which is capable of giving UV light as well as visible light. It goes on through a filter, goes through the monochromator, okay, and from there it goes on to your sample, okay. Once it goes on to your sample, you have a sample as well as a reference over there because you have to subtract the effect of reference over there. Here you don't have any reference at all. See here you directly give the sample as such. Okay. And you have a sample over here. And once the sample emits, you know, what happens is the sample, the emitted light of the sample is ob observed one wavelength at a time. That is what which is being utilized in uh, fluorescence spectrophotometer or fluorimeter as a whole. So initially in the UV visible spectra, you are giving one particular wavelength, one at a time, 300, 301, 302, 303 to the uh, molecule. In fluorescent spectra, what you are actually doing is you are measuring what the emission of the molecule will be at 300 nanometer, then at 301 nanometer, then at 302 nanometer. So this monochromator, which is the monochromator which is kept after the sample is excited, is being utilized for that. So when the excited sample, de-excites and emits fluorescence or phosphorescence, whatever it is, 
the emitted light will be having a range of frequencies. So the detector, which is again a photomultiplier tube, actually detects one wavelength at a particular time. Just imagine your molecule uh, emits at uh, uh, emits at uh, after 500 nanometer. Maybe you are observing the emission from 500 to 800 nanometer. So you are exciting the molecule. Once you are exciting the molecule, you are asking the molecule to emit the radiation. The molecule emits. Then you start observing the uh, intensity at 500 nanometer. You plot it. Then you observe the intensity at pi naught one nanometer. You plot it. Then you observe the intensity of pi naught two nanometer. Then you plot it. Then you observe the intensity of pi naught three, and it goes on up to 800 nanometer. So here, compared to UV visible, there is no need of giving one particular wavelength, uh, one at a time, to the excited molecule. Okay. The first thing which you have to uh, keep in your mind is. Uh, always a UV visible absorption spectra should be taken before you use a fluorimeter. Just because fluorescence actually is given by the molecule once the molecule is excited. So if you want to know where the molecule is to be excited, if you want to know the correct wavelength where the molecule is, uh, is to be excited, you have to take a UV visible absorption spectra. Once you take the UV visible absorption spectra, is there any necessity of giving every wavelength? No, right? You are required to give only that particular wavelength where the molecule has maximum absorption. For example, if you take this particular example, just consider this absorption spectrum, only this absorption spectrum. You know that the molecule absorbs at 380 nanometer. So when you are using a fluorescent spectra, instead of giving all the, the value from 300 nanometer to 800 nanometer, it is more than enough and more than sufficient just by giving 380 nanometer from this light source. So light source gives everything. Your monochromometer is adjusted in your instrument such that a 380 nanometer flashlight is actually given to the sample. Only 380 nanometer is given. Why 380 nanometer is given? The molecule has maximum absorption at 380 nanometer, which the UV visible spectra told us. So 380 nanometer is specifically given. So the monochromometer does not have that much particular work. The diffraction grating over there is adjusted just one time for that particular molecule. The sample gets excited. And once the sample gets excited, just see the direction in which the monochromometer is kept. See, uh, earlier when we were dealing with uh, the UV visible spectra, the photomultiplier tube was in straight line with the monochromometer, right? The initial monochromometer, the photomultiplier tube was in straight line. Just, uh, just see the arrow or the, the uh, cursor which I'm pointing to. This probably, this would be a region where the photomultiplier tube uh, was kept. The analyzer was kept. But in you, uh, fluorescence, you know, the analyzer or the monochromometer is actually kept perpendicular to the sample. This is because when 380 nanometer light passes through this, some light definitely may not be absorbed by the sample. Of course, there will be Raman scattering. There will be so many scattering, you know, taking place in this molecule. All the scattering takes place and it actually is uh, uh, taking place in all the other directions. And the incoming light direction is actually uh, completely cut off. And to cut off the incoming light direction, this emission is always taken uh, perpendicular to the incoming light. Otherwise, the detector will always detect incoming light also. So instead of uh, detecting the incoming light and cutting it off, it is always better that you uh, observe the emission at right angles to the incoming light. That is something which is used in UV visible spectra. So this is something which you have to keep in your mind. OK? and. Uh, these are the quits which are used for UV visible spectra or uh, I mean uh, fluorescent spectra. For UV visible spectra, two sided quits are fine. Two sided quits in the sense this is actually a four sided quit. Four sided quit means in all the four sides the quit is transparent. There are quits which are uh, lesser in amount in which two only two sides are transparent. That is more than enough for a UV visible spectra because light enters from one side. It goes through, it goes out through another side. That is all what UV visible spectra is doing. But for a fluorescent spectra, you definitely require a four-sided quid because when the light enters through one direction and it goes out through the other direction, the fluorescence are actually measured in the perpendicular direction, and, and hence all the four sides of the quid need to be transparent. So when you, are, if you are trying to install any uh, fluorimeter or in your college or in your uh, institution or something like that, always keep in mind that two-sided quids are useful only for absorption while four-sided quids are a necessity for fluorescent compounds also. Here also the light source can be mercury arc lamp, xenon arc lamp, tungsten lamp, and you can be a tunable dye laser also. Laser normally are induced because 
mercury arc lamp as xenon arc lamp and tungsten lamps they are actually mm, lesser costly compared to that of laser and monochromators and filters and the qet as i told you it is all very similar to that of uv visible absorption and the detectors which are used are photomultiplier tube and this is uh, an example of absorption and emission the same molecule the absorption as well as emission is plotted in this particular uh, uh, what do you say diagram so the same molecule absorbs in this region it has a common region over here spectral overlap over here and the emission of the molecule you never expect a fluorescence emission to coincide with the absorption and always you have a so stoke check because there is a de excitation of the molecule taking place in the higher levels higher excited electronic levels as well as vibration levels to a lower en energy level which actually results in uh, uh, which actually results in uh, the stoke shift which is observed in fluorescence so what are the application of all these molecules so fluorescence you know applications of fluorescence are also useful any molecule one of the major application which i presently use in my thesis you know i am almost uh, uh, submitting my thesis one one of my polymers which is communicated to uh, macromolecules right now it is uh, um, like the polymer has actually has an emission uh, at uh, um, uh, approximately 470 nanometer you know when the molecule aggregates in one particular solvent the aggregate actually results in increase in emission okay so this is a, a molecule an example of a molecule i took it from some paper i don't remember uh, this is the molecule which the authors have reported when your molecule is aggregating the aggregation results in emission of this molecule so just by looking at the emission spectrum you can actually analyze whether the molecule is aggregated or not so the aggregation of the molecule the drug delivery drug release study of the molecule just imagine you are using a fluorescent molecule a molecule which is capable of emitting light so fluorescence or phosphor and something like a curcumin so if you are taking curcumin as a drug you know a curcumin you load it into your uh, your polymeric system or a delivery system and a free curcumin gives an emission and the uh, curcumin which is loaded into your drug delivery system uh, in, inside your delivery system gives some other emission you are uh, giving some sensitivity such as ph or temperature or whatever it is you are asking the delivery system to release the drug by just monitoring the emission spectra of your molecule you will be able to say you will be able to predict whether the drug has come out or not you know there are so many applications of all these fluorescence spectra which you can go through and the next part um when i was dealing with uh, uh, solar cells you know i was more interested in how these molecule behave in the excited state no i uh, the uv visible spectra actually deals with the behavior of the molecule in the ground state how the molecule absorbs when the molecule is present in the ground state okay and uh, fluorescence spectra actually tells you how the molecule behaves once it reaches the excited state and it comes down so we have dealt with the behavior of the molecule while going up and we have dealt with the behavior of the molecule while coming down now we are going to deal the behavior of the molecule which behaves when it is staying at the excited state so going is dealt with from ground state to excited state this dealt with uv visible spectra coming down is dealt with fluorescence spectra at the excited state is actually used by laser flash photolysis just imagine you have to study a free radical or excited triplet state which exists only for millisecond or microsecond just imagine you have to find out the excited single state of the molecule which exists for nanosecond just imagine you have to do some electron transfer processes there are so many processes including photosynthesis you know in which the electron transfer processes take place in picosecond or femtosecond how are you going to study so if you want to study such ultra fast processes you should be using an instrument which is more sensitive which is more fast than the process which is being taken correct so by using a uv visible spectra or a fluorescence spectra it is not enough because all that takes place in millisecond or microsecond you know maximum nanosecond it does not deal with any excited state of the molecule so now you are using an instrument we are dealing going to deal with an instrument which is known as laser flash photolysis which is faster than the any of the processes which is mentioned over here there are so many laser flash photolysis system we have a nanosecond laser flash photolysis system in which the laser flash system is used to study energy states present in the nanosecond we have picosecond laser flash photolysis system we have femtosecond laser flash photolysis system in iit chennai i have been there for studying some of my molecules in fem femtosecond laser flash photolysis system because many of my ruthenium complexes were not having any kind of uh, 
uh, what do you say a triplet property or something like that as a result of which all these uh, excited state were singlet so i was forced to do femtosecond second laser and the technology is completely different so this is a general <coughs> diagram of a laser flash photolysis the diagram of the laser flash this is the laser and you have uh, a motor sound when you switch on the laser and uh, excuse me you actually require more than one hour to switch on the laser if the laser is not turned on one to one and a half hours is actually required for the instrument to operate so this is actually a general picture of laser the laser which which is usually used in all these systems femtosecond nanosecond or picosecond the instrumentation which is very complicated because from femtosecond to when you go from nanosecond to femtosecond i mean picosecond and from picosecond to femtosecond you have some additional filters and additional slits which are used to cut short the time you know in all these lasers you use ndag laser neodymium yttrium allium laser ndag laser uh, ndag laser actually gives you a, a, a high intensity pulse of a pulse of 1064 nanometer and in the laser all our molecules as you know it doesn't absorb in 1064 nanometer if you are capable of making a molecule which is absorbing at 1064 nanometer probably you will be a king because it can directly be used for making solar cells because <laughs> because uh, uh, NIR region dyes are having very high demand. It can be used for photodynamic therapy also. All our molecules definitely will be absorbing in uh, UV region and still as visible region. As a result of which the high intensity pulse in the laser can be frequency doubled to 532 nanometer and 355 nanometers. So we have a laser source which is capable of producing light either at 1064 nanometer or 532 nanometer or 355 nanometer. And depending upon the molecule which we are using almost all the molecules will be having an absorption at 355 nanometer which we are dealing with and many of the molecules will be having an absorption at 532 nanometer just for the sake of saying something uh, a particular value we will go on with 355 nanometer so what you do is you adjust your laser flash beam to 355 nanometer and you keep the sample when you keep the sample like this you know a laser actually produces a flash of 350 nanometer just a flash when you switch on the uh, instrument a flash of 355 nanometer laser is produced in the sample so a very high intensity of 355 nanometer when it falls onto the sample just imagine what happens since the intensity is very high almost 80 to 90 percent of the molecules which is present in the sample it gets excited to the first excited state okay immediately after the laser is flashed the molecule is excited and immediately the xenon arc lamp which all those uh, filters or and something which we used with uh, uh, the which uh, which we used with UV visible spectra are used to analyze the molecule which is present in the excited state. So instead of using the so if you take away the setup of this your laser setup or this prism etc. The entire remaining thing the remaining thing which I am uh, highlighting using my cursor is basically a UV visible spectra photometer setup. Okay. The only thing is that in the UV visible spectrophotometer setup here, you are using a ground state sample, but in laser flash photolysis, you are actually using a laser to make the sample excited. You are keeping the sample in the ground state. You are using the laser to excite the sample in the excited state. And by a, some combination of all these instruments, what you are doing is you are keeping the molecule in the excited state. At the instant the molecule is excited, you know, you are taking the absorption spectrum. And the absorption spectrum over here, there is a small um, uh, uh, small problem by taking absorption spectrum over here. The problem is, as that of the UV visible spectra, you cannot give one wavelength at a time, 300 nanometer, 301 nanometer, 302 nanometer, because giving at one particular wavelength at a time is a tedious process. So what you do is the entire wavelength from the UV as well as visible region is given to this molecule in a fraction of a second, within no time. And uh, that is actually synchronized with the laser flash. That is what the instrument is doing. Immediately after the laser, after the laser is flashed, the non arc lamp, you know, it gives the light again in a flash. And when that light is given in a flash, these two are synchronized such that the molecule at the excited state absorbs the light which is given from the xenon lamp simultaneously. The excitation as well as the absorption takes place simultaneously with the synchronization and ultimately you will be uh, getting an absorption spectrum of the molecule in the excited state. That is what laser flash water is doing. So this is my paper, which is, I mean, this is my molecule, which is not reported yet. Uh, the quantum yield of this molecule was very less. So this is something which is known as a transient 
dK spectra. That is, once the molecule is excited at one particular wavelength, what happens is the molecule dK slowly, and this dK is actually observed as in the form of a graph. By taking the average of this particular thing, you will be able to observe that uh, the molecule has a very uh, less dK time uh, of maybe point uh, one microsecond. The, the molecule has a very less dK time of point one microsecond because we take the average of the middle portion of this and we uh, note the time and that will actually gives you the extended state lifetime of that particular molecule. So this transient absorption spectrum actually represents the absorption spectra of the molecule when it is present in the excited state. The normal absorption spectra represents the molecule when the molecule is present in the ground state and the transient uh, ex, uh, absorption spectra represents the molecule presence of the molecule in the excited state. So and uh, so these are the two important data which you ob obtain from laser flash, flash photolysis studies. I am rushing through that. Another important aspect of laser flash photolysis study is that you will be able to monitor uh, what do you say uh, the electron transfer processes. Uh, my dye is actually a ruthenium dye, the same dye. Uh, this dye is an electron donor, so that is capable of giving an electron to uh, a very strong electron acceptor. And we have an electron acceptor which is known as uh, methyl valazid. So my dye, when it is excited, it slowly transfers this electron to the methyl valazid and it gets uh, oxidized and the methyl valazid accepts the electron. And the methyl valazid has a particular property of giving an absorption spectra like this. When you do a laser flash photolysis, when you shine your light with, uh, shine your molecule with a laser flash, the molecule gets excited. And immediately the electron is transferred into methyl valazid. So in a sample, in a QET, a four-sided QET, what you do is you, you put the sample, you put some amount of methyl valazid also. And when you shine a laser light, the methyl valazid, which has a characteristic absorption at 385 nanometer, that can be monitored. And the growth of the methyl valazid can be observed. So we have a standard with this ruthenium plus bipyridine. And my molecule is named as RUDA2. So when you consider for the same concentration of my molecule with the standard, for the same incoming excitation light, for the same amount of methyl valazid, you can see the intensity of methyl valazid with my molecule is methyl valazid uh, MV plus, that is the reduced state of methyl valazid is more compared to that for the sample. Uh, that simply means that my molecule RUDA2 is a better electron donor uh, compared to the standard value. So my electron, my sample can be utilized for, you know, uh, giving a, uh, uh, can be utilized for a, uh, uh, preparing a solar cell and that was my study so electron transfer process can also be uh, studied using laser flash photolysis this is another molecule which uh, also is to be reported and uh, this also has a very uh, high uh, electron transfer capability compared to standard so these are uh, the various studies which you can do with laser flash photolysis study so maybe for the last uh, one hour you have, uh, you have been patiently listening to me uh, on uh, uv visible uh, fluorescence and laser flash photolysis and i once again, thank uh, the coordinators for giving me an opportunity to present my topic. You know, I uh, I personally, as uh, uh, Smitha Teaser was saying, you know, I am a public speaker. My all my talks and my publications and my paintings and photographs, everything is available in my uh, website www.rmk.in. So if you are interested in uh, uh, knowing science videos related to physics, max, whatever it is, science video, you can go through my channel. My channel name is uh, No Science live science and uh, there has been so many government utilities uh, because of the channel and i am very happy about that also so once again i thank all the audience for patient listening and i'll be happy to answer a few questions thank you arvind for your nice presentation yes. and you started from basics and explained the concept very well i think all of you have enjoyed the session very well now the session is open for discussion. Uh, if you have some queries, you can type in the chat box. Okay, MSDBP is something that is the uh, code name given to that particular molecule. That's all. I mean, it has nothing to got to do with Hiba. Been see, she asked a question. MSDBP. It's actually a code name given to that particular molecule. Nothing got to do with science. Hadwin, there is yeah. uh, one more question from. Uh, Satyendra Kumar yeah. and uh, he asked what is the relation between UV and IR? Relation between UV and IR? Uh. Uh, I mean I didn't understand what he meant. You know. UV visible I mean, it, it deals with totally two different aspects right UV visible spectra deals with 
uh, absorption of molecule in UV as well as visible light. IR deals with vibration of the molecule. What I actually uh, try to say in that particular fashion, maybe that created the confusion. Whenever you are dealing with the UV visible absorption spectra, which is in the U-shaped spectra, you know, it includes the vibrations also. That is all what I uh, meant to say. I never meant to say that IR spectra is, uh, uh, you know, uh, encompassed in uh, UV visible spectra. And one more question here from Aisha Sumra. Sure. Is it necessary to calibrate instrument with respective solvent in the sample? Um, calibrate the instrument with the respective solvent. No, that is not necessary. It all depends upon what you do. You know, normally you don't calibrate the instrument with the solvent because you are you already using a blank for the solvent. So that is not at all necessary. Okay. And uh, when you are dealing with uh, um, laser flash photolysis, you know, you always have to deal with, uh, you have, always have to purge uh, nitrogen or argon or any of the inert gas through that because the presence of oxygen is actually a big poison. Oxygen, since it is in the present in the triplex state, you know, you always go for uh, a laser flash photolysis studies for only those molecules which you expect having a triplex state in the excited state. So if you have oxygen in the triplet state, what happens is the oxygen in the triplet state as well as your molecule triplet state, they combine and the oxygen gets gone to a, uh, the, the oxygen actually gets converted into the single state and the molecule will be de-excited. And as a result of it, you won't be able to study any of the excited states. So whenever you are taking a sample for laser flash photolysis, you purge with, you pass nitrogen gas or any of the uh, inert gas, make it air free and only then you go for laser flash photolysis. Okay. If you have no doubt, uh, teacher, there, are more, uh, there, there are more questions. I think how can I prepare solution for UV analysis? Amount needed. Okay. The amount needed is One, concentration is lesser than 10 raised to uh, minus 6 or 10 raised to minus 7 because the maximum absorbance which you can get is too early. That's the maximum absorbance. So, more dilute the solution is, the better absorbance and the better vision of your spectrum would be. So an ideal concentration would be 10 raised to minus 6 or 10 raised to minus 7. Anything lesser than 10 raised to minus 5. So what you can do is, uh, if you have a, a small uh, 10 ml uh, standard flask or something like that, you take the lowest possible standard flask, maybe 25 ml or 10 ml or 50 ml. From if, it, if 50 ml is something which is available to you in the college, take the 50 ml. From there, you take 1 ml, you dilute it into, again, another 50 ml. From there, take 1 ml, you dilute it into another 50 ml. You dilute it such that the concentration is less than 10 raised to minus 6 or 10 raised to minus 7, you will be getting a very important spectra. Never uh, um, uh, prepare a sample by giving a spec if you are doing some uh, quantitative study. If you are just doing a qualitative study, there is no harm at all. You put a very, 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 very small piece of sample, and that is more than enough. But if you are doing a quantitative study, make a stock solution from. Sir, one more question about laser dyes. Yeah. Laser dyes. So what? Uh, the question is that can you brief about laser dyes? Uh, so what on laser dyes? Because laser dyes are totally different from laser flash photolysis. Uh, Excuse me, sir. sir. Uh, can I ask you a question? Please. Myself, Dr. Hari Patman from NSS College, Narmada. Uh, as part of the project, we have prepared a uh, dye doped film that is natural dye doped polymer film okay. uh, with varying doping concentrations. Okay. And what we have found that uh, the UV visible absorption spectra <laughs> the intensity increased with increase in doping concentration. But when we have taken PL, photoluminescence, the intensity has uh, diminished after some particular concentration. So can you suggest me what can be the reason for that? Can you tell me once again? Increase, with increase in doping concentration, the UV visible absorption spectra intensity increases, okay. but uh, the photoluminescence spectra intensity decreases okay. from a particular uh, value. Okay, so uh, it is not the artifact of the instrument, right? No, no, no. <laughs> no. We are uh, repeated there. Oh, okay, okay. No, no, I, I, like I didn't make, I didn't make fun of you because 
So all such uh, uh, things are happening. Can you just yeah, send yeah, me yeah. I will uh, uh, look into it. Uh, this okay. is my WhatsApp number. And so unless and until I see this, but I won't be able to give you any conclusion. Right? Normally, it shouldn't happen. That's why you asked me the question, right? So I'll just look at this picture and I'll tell you. Okay, sir. I'll mail to you. Thank you. Aravind, yeah. there is one more question. Yes. What are the flash photolysis application? What are the okay. flash photolysis application? One, is, one thing is, you know how the molecule... First thing is, you you will be able to know whether the molecule is in the single state or the triplet state. Because molecules in the single state has so many applications, molecules in the triplet state has some other applications. Okay, that is the first thing. The second thing is for processes like uh, uh, solar cells or processes like if you are trying to mimic uh, photosynthesis, if you are doing some uh, what do you say photodynamic therapy studies, the electron transfer is very important. So the rate of electron transfer, the kinetics of electron transfer, the excitation time, all such data will be obtained from laser flash photolysis studies. So when you get all these data, you know, you'll be able to design such systems which are which actually efficiently act as a photo electron transfer system. So these are the two major applications of laser flash photolysis. It is seldom used, it is not used by everyone. I think there are no more questions here. Okay, you can be uh, you can be free, you can contact me anytime. Uh, my WhatsApp number is given. My uh, you go to my website. My email ID is also there. You can contact me anytime. No issues. I'll be very happy to. Maybe in WhatsApp when you give, maybe within one or two days I will definitely reply. I travel every day. So. Okay. Rate of electron transfer during photosynthesis is uh, so. Yeah, definitely we can measure rate of electron transfer during photosynthesis. There is something which I showed you of methyl valgen. I just showed you the growth of methyl valgen, right? From that intensity, we can directly understand the rate of electron transfer. Name of my YouTube channel is No Science, Live Science. I have a Facebook page on that. So photolysis is basically you are splitting your molecule, lysis, uh, splitting your molecule in the presence of light. That is basically known as uh, photolysis. So laser flash photolysis is known as photolysis just because your molecule always has a possibility of getting disrupted. You won't be getting your molecule back. So you are lis you are your molecule. You are actually breaking down your molecule. That is the main uh, why it got its name. Okay. 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 Now, if you have no queries, we are concluding the session today. And on behalf of me and Department of Chemistry, NSS College, Mancheri. I express my deep gratitude to Mr. Aravind K for your wonderful session delivered here. Thank and you. and I invite our HOD, Dr. Bijidas K, <coughs> for concluding the section here. Thank you. Bijidas, sir. Sorry, are you audible to me now? Yes, sir. Yes, audible, sir. Audible. Okay, okay. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank sir. you. Thank you. I'm very much proud of to my team, uh, Dr. Yamuna, Smita, Bashpa, and Vinith, and our former HOD, Sindhu teacher. Actually, this uh, seminar series was a very uh, success uh, part, and we have very good presentations. We have four very good topics. Four eminent personalities have conducted the program. Unfortunately, Dr. Hairi from Switzerland, he was unable to deliver his talk. And we, we are thinking of planning one more series, uh, mainly on nanotechnology. And I thank uh, all the participants here. On behalf of the Department of Chemistry, I thank all the participants here. And especially my sincere thanks to Dr. Professor Aravind for his nice presentation. And I am uh, formally, I'm thanking my team also. Uh, thank you very much. I'm handing over to the coordinator, Dr. Yamuna. Please. 
thank you Vijay sir good afternoon to all participants and uh, our today's resource person Dr. Mr. Aravind and actually I'm uh, very uh, thankful to all of you all of those participants here because uh, this is a series we planned it for five lecture series but uh, unfortunately we had to restrict it up to four lectures uh, due to some unfortunate situations from Dr. Harin Sanna. But during all the sessions, all these participants sticked on to us and uh, they were very inspiring. Actually, they were calling in between, like giving some positive feedback and uh, personal messages and the calls we received and emails also. And this actually inspired us and this motivates us, us to go for another session. And also the resource persons were also very satisfied about the participants' interaction, the questions asked and so. And also the very the most unfortunate thing we had was the selection of resource persons. Um, the first session was hand, uh, handled by Professor, uh, sorry, Doctor Pritam Bharadwaj, and then Sajini Vadukumpuli take over, and then we had a uh, Doctor Ravind Rajan Medikalam, and we are now ending with uh, Mr. Aravind Ji. And all this proved to be uh, very eminent and excellent resource persons actually. And these people, the participants, gave very very good feedback to us and um, we are thankful to the participants who stick on to us and again as i said motivated us for another season and we will be as we just said we will be going on with uh, the another series like this and uh, you will be our high priority invitees and um, we expect this cooperation in future also and actually this we form like a group and we can for collaborate for academic and research reasons also some relations Developed like that but between the researchers, I mean, the resource persons and participants, etc. So, we are very successful. I would say we are really successful on organizing the seminar, a webinar series, and this tough time of pandemic that, that we are going through. And uh, yes, um, I'm very thankful to the participants and also to all those resource persons. Uh, persons and uh, with an apology, uh, I regret to say that we had to cancel the session from Dr. Harry. And uh, he offered to give another session when he is back in full health. And we let's hope to meet again, including Dr. Hari there. And uh, because we don't want to disappoint you or we expect you to have a nice and a session. And that's why you joined here. And so I hope uh, we will not let you missing that session. And in soon future, we will do that, I hope. And I thank um, the team, as we just said, the team chemistry, as I always wrote to you. Uh, officially, yes, but and also other colleagues from the college, the NSS College Manjeri, especially our principal, Dr. Al Sajid, who always encouraged us. And uh, thank you all. And uh, I would like to give an information on certification. You will receive a feedback form because this was a question of frequently asked about the feedback form and certification. The plan was, as I explained in the beginning, the plan was to give a single certificate at the end of the series, so you will get receive a certificate. But before that, this week, you will receive a feedback form and uh, after submission of the feedback form, you will automatically receive a certificate. So please wait, please expect uh, the feedback form for the whole, uh, during the week because uh, due to the email, number of email restricted by Gmail, we cannot contact you all on a single day. So please wait the whole week and then you will receive a feedback form followed by certification. And yes, thank you and um, Yes, I would like to have my colleague Bashpa to speak up here. I would like to have it here, Bashpa. Bashpa? Thank you, Emina. Good afternoon, all. And I'm very happy that as we are having a successful seven webinar series with four nice talks and nice presentations. And I would like to thank all the participants for your cooperation and active participation and expecting this in our coming series also. Thank you all. Okay, so let's um, stop for the time being and we will see each other with a new series. And um, yeah, thank you and bye-bye for the time being. Thank you all, thank you all.